Okay. Well, Steve, my good friend, welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, though I have known you for, I tried to even think back to the first time I met you. We have a baby on the phone, so forgive all of the baby Great. cooing. But um, I think it's been four years. Seems like um, And the first time I met you, you were developing these career cards. Mm -hmm. You've always been really passionate about helping people develop in their career, develop as individuals, um, gain knowledge, so on and so forth. And then we established a friendship through a book club. Mm -hmm. And ironically enough, you have now built a company called Book Club. Yep. Um, so I, with that, wanted to kind of transition to what you feel like entrepreneurship is and what makes you an entrepreneur outside of actually being a by the book definition of an entrepreneur right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when I think about entrepreneurship, I think about calculated risks. I think a lot of times people think of entrepreneurs as crazy risk takers. There's different types of entrepreneurs who have become the archetype for entrepreneurship in our society. The Steve Jobs of the world and the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world. And they do big and crazy things that at any time could derail and turn into massive and monumental failure. Um, but I think that by and large entrepreneurs take calculated risks. They're, they're far more risk averse than we like to uh, think of them typically. Uh, they think that the best way to control risk is to actually uh, be in charge, to yeah. try to create the value themselves and to kind of lead the way themselves. Um, and so I think of it as someone who takes calculated risks to create value in the world. Um, and I think that uh, they look at problems that haven't been solved and they imagine solutions that they can create with the help of other people um, and their forward thinking customers. I think there's far too much entrepreneurship in the world that tries to solve problems that have already been solved before. I think that there's Ooh, so what many- What do you mean by that? Well, so a lot of times we say, well, let's just build a better mousetrap. If I could just build a better mousetrap, then you know, I could create X amount of value and wealth for myself. And instead think about what are the problems that haven't been solved yet? And, and we sometimes think, I think, in the world of entrepreneurship today that most of the good problems have been solved. Uh, but I think that there's far more problems that have not been solved uh, than we think. And so I, I like to think of entrepreneurship as looking for solutions to problems that haven't been solved yet. And the book uh, Zero to One by Peter Thiel is a good example of looking through, you know, how do we go from zero, he calls it from zero to one, which is nothing has been created, nothing has been solved in this space to now we've created it and solved it in this space. And, uh, and done it so well that uh, you know, nobody else can compete with us in essence. And so I really like to think about on entrepreneurship as taking those calculated risks to create value, uh, solving problems that uh, haven't been solved before. Yeah, so in the context of today, do you feel like we'll have more or less entrepreneurs with COVID-19, <laughs> with yeah. this whole scenario? I mean to your point, right? We have a slew of problems right now that we've never had to encounter before, but we also end up having a bit more fear and risk aversion. So what do you, what do you think there? Yeah. So there's going to be new problems uh, that we never knew would exist. Some of them we knew were coming, but we've accelerated the, the pace towards uh, these problems and solutions uh, more than we would have expected. Um, one of the key ingredients for us having more entrepreneurs in the future is the fact that 3 million people last week filed unemployment claims, the largest single jump maybe in the history of yeah. the world. Yeah. Um, and we're going to have another 3 million probably this week, and it could be another 3 million next week, and it could be 12 to 20 million people out of work that didn't expect to be out of work a month ago. And many of those people were sitting on the fence thinking, I really would like to solve this problem or that problem. I'd really like to start this business or that business. And now they've had this gentle to uh, very intense push into the world of entrepreneurship. They're thinking, you know what, I'd rather create value in the world and solve a problem that's never been solved before and take a couple of risks than go and find another job. Um, and so a lot of entrepreneurs will be born in, in that space. Um, further, a bunch of entrepreneurs who, for no, to no fault of their own, they had strong businesses, they had strong employees, they had strong growth, 
all the numbers looked great, and now they're out of business. And so there's space uh, for those new entrepreneurs to come in and to create value. There's space for some of those failed entrepreneurs to say, you know, what does the new world look like? And let's create something new. Let's solve a different problem or a new problem or solve the same problem that we were solving, but in a different way. And so I think that those conditions help to create a bunch of entrepreneurs. But to your point, there's other problems like um, social isolation and, and social distancing, which is actually going to be the new norm. Yeah. It's not a temporary pause. It's, it's not, we're all going to go work from home and then we're all going to come back to the office in droves. You know, some <laughs> will come back and some won't. Yeah. Uh, some business owners will realize that this is actually a more effective way to run their business, both cost effective, but also from a productivity and, and yeah. like a wellness yeah. perspective, integrating our lives. You've got your child, Phoebe, there, right there, yeah. and, and you're experiencing that. And now you're going to go back to work and say, listen, I was so much more productive there. And I was integrated with my family and I feel better than I've ever felt before. And you're going to do the best work of your life. And so that's going to create some conditions for some new entrepreneurial endeavors and ideas as well. Yeah. So I guess the next question then is what, if we're talking about calculated risk here, mm -hmm. what does it take to make calculated risk? Are there strengths that, lend someone to be more entrepreneurial because they're able to make those calculated assessments or is it uh the past year of their lives preparation mm -hmm. um you think like logically technically logistically whatever people can't take calculated risk unless they have a few things set in place or can they yeah um i think that there's four real key components to uh, creating success. You have to be able to support really great relationships. You have to be able to have influence. And so being able to speak and have people listen and want to follow. So relationships and influence go really strongly together. And then you've got uh, strategy is a, is a really key component. Um, so being able to see all the pieces and how they fit together. And then there's a, another piece uh, that's really critical, obviously, which is execution. So if you take those four key components, relationships, strategy, execution, and influence, very few people, very, very few people can do all four of those things uh, really, really well. In fact, I might argue that there aren't any that I've met that can really crush all four really, really well. We'll call that maybe that unicorn person. And so what does that mean? How, how do we take initiative and go out and be successful? and taking advantage of some of these opportunities, I would argue that almost everyone needs a good partner. And so from, from my side, I crush it from a strategy and influence perspective. Like that's my strong suit, is I can take all of these pieces and put them together in these really interesting mixes and understand how all of the next steps can fit together. And then I can share that with people in a way that's compelling to them, they feel inspired in this vision, and then they wanna follow, that's influence, right? Now, sometimes I don't take care of all of my relationships really, really well. And sometimes I don't do a great job of just keeping my head down and executing. And so I've partnered with someone and, and my co-founder Todd has that execution and that relationships capability. So together we're able to do the four things that are really required to take initiative. And so I think that anybody who thinks they can just go it alone, like there are some solopreneur opportunities out there, consulting and speaking and writing, and there's some different things as well. But even the best writers in the world who I've met, some of them, um, they partner with people to help them to keep them on a schedule and to execute the editors and all of this. So <laughs> think about the relationships you need to create that whole, uh, that hole that you need to be able to take initiative and take advantage of opportunities. Yeah. Well, so as you started listing those off, I was like trying to remember them like, wait, he's talking about something that I know very well and I actually have it pulled up on my personal computer and that's the Gallup strengths. Yep. And yep. we've talked a lot about that. Oh, baby fell over. We got to lift her back up. Gotta go take care of Phoebe. But um, we talked a lot about that and like started comparing our own strengths, each of ours, our top five at least. Mm -hmm. um, and that whole assessment has been so instrumental in my life professional and personal mm -hmm. um and so i'm really glad that you mentioned that um i don't know that gallup's intent with this was to be an outline for entrepreneurship by any means not at first no definitely right it was just strengths and then they've kind of and i haven't read their 
strengths-based leadership. I read their strengths-based marriage, which is awesome. But um, how did you feel like, why, why did you feel like that um, model mapped so well to entrepreneurship? Yeah, so they also have a book about builders where you can take an assessment that helps you identify your capability and readiness for entrepreneurship as well. And it, it leans towards finding partners and people to augment your weaknesses and, and to reinforce and build on your strengths. And so that one's worth looking at. Um, it was an assessment that uh, had profound impact in my life because I was fired from my first job out of college. And I was told by the person who happened to be a really phenomenal entrepreneur and still has a thriving and successful business uh, here in Utah. But I was told that I was uh, unemployable. And no. yeah, he told me that uh, really that my only hope was to become an entrepreneur. That <laughs> I was not employable um, in a normal job. Um, and so I think he, he meant it to be inspiring to go and build a business. Um, but it was it was demoralizing for me and a little bit uh, degrading. I thought, man, I'm I'm screwed. Um, there's no way I'm going to make it. Uh, and so I went and took a couple of assessments that a career center told me to take, and one of those was the Gallup Strengths Finder. And in the Strengths Finder, took it as a young college student. Yep, yep. So it was right. It was kind of right out of college, and that first job just got fired, and I took it, and uh, I got these strengths back that were strategic and ideation and future the same since you did it yeah so i've taken it a couple times and and prior to getting fired i had um, command and significance and those have been very low ever since and i think that uh, part of the reason is because command and significance me needing to be important and me needing to be in charge uh, were big reasons that I got fired from my first job. And so there's some immense trauma and stress associated with trying to be in charge and trying to be important okay. that yeah. have led me to uh, not okay. care so much about those things. Yeah. Uh, and so now having uh, input, individualization, those, that mix of things really is a, a, quite an entrepreneurial mix in Gallup's research. And uh, the career counselor there said, hey, you should go and, uh, and look at entrepreneurship. And I actually, um, I got offered a job at Qualtrics as a salesperson there, and I didn't take that job. I got offered um, a job as a salesperson for ADP, and then um, I was working with Lucid, uh, a local company here, and I was one of the first five employees there, and uh, I was looking at that and potentially being an entrepreneur and being a part of a founding team there. I ended up going to Accenture, which is far from entrepreneurship it's consulting yeah. and it's like fit into the mold and be a cog in the machine uh, but it's because i i knew that i needed to augment some of my capabilities with a better level of execution and the ability to work with a collaborative team and that sort of thing and i wasn't quite ready to go out and take those calculated risks and create value on my own and now fast forward 10 years and some of those decisions were some of the best decisions I could have made to lead me to this well, place now where I can go and take these risks. And I think of contextually with what you're saying right there. And when we first met, you were at Instructure, you were a product manager and you were looking to help build a new product um, for career development. Yep. And you were able to be an entrepreneur, um, an entrepreneur within an already established organization. <clears throat> which, I mean, I love your insight on this, but I feel like that has totally prepared you to take this leap, these calculated risks, to be a full-on entrepreneur co-founder of a startup now. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I would love to chat about that for just a second. Um, I think one thing needs to be clear, though, from the very outset of the conversation is that whatever career moves that you make that are preparing yourself for entrepreneurship, they can get you to the cliff but they can't get you past yeah. that gap to entrepreneurship. There's a massive gap yeah. between, between any job, no matter how risky and how entrepreneurial it feels and it seems and how many skills it seems relate to entrepreneurship. Yeah. There is this leap that you take at some point that you just have to be willing to- Leave the safety net. Leave it, yep. Yeah. And, and you could say, well, I'm so prepared. I've done all these things. And the truth, truly like, talk to any person who started a thing from one to then two to then three, the difference between um, a two person company and entrepreneurship at an established company is massive. Yeah. You're going to have to take that leap. Um, but there are things that you can do to prepare. And one of those things is understanding um, 
how value is created in a business. And so jumping from just being a product manager, like you were talking about, to being kind of an entrepreneur product manager that's responsible for a budget and a brand new product and all those sorts of things. As a product manager, you're looking at how do I build a cool thing and build it so that people will use it. When you move to that entrepreneurship realm, you're starting to think about the business side. So the difference between a product leader and a senior product leader and an entrepreneurial product leader is the level of understanding that they have about value creation in the business. What does it mean to acquire a new customer and actually close that deal when it's still hard, it's still selling on vision? Um, what does it mean to then retain that customer, help to solve their problems and achieve the right outcomes and think about it as a cross-functional business, sales, product, marketing, all the pieces and components. Those are the things that you wanna hone and build before making the leap if you can, uh, because they'll, they'll help you immensely um, but again, that leap is still, it's still a big one. Yeah. So talk to us about book club in the context of those things, the, the vision and the value that you've set. And, um, I, can we disclose? Yeah, sure. It's great. That, um, Weave was your first paying customer and how you... I'm happy if you're happy with it. Yeah. <laughs> about your legal team, if they're happy with it. But <laughs> If not, we'll edit this out of the episode, yeah, right? Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, but like, and so what the value was you were trying to establish, how you went about building that, and and did you have to, because we are your first paying customer, did you have to sell the value to the company as opposed to necessarily the product? Kind of like what you were just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So I'll, I'll take you back just a little bit. Um, it was the end of January. Jan last week of January, and there was no business. We didn't have anything. Nothing existed. No LLC. No LLC. There's there's nothing. There's no whiteboards with ideas on it. There's nothing. Um, okay. And um, I was working through some ideas with uh, my co-founder Todd, and we had a bunch of things on the whiteboard. So you were looking for a business idea still? We were, we were still looking for a business idea. And we had about 12 things that we were considering. And they were all just ideas on a list. Okay. And we decided together that we would pick a book club. One, because it was one of the things on the list, if not the only thing on the list, that didn't originate in one of us or the other of us. It was a shared idea where we had kind of come together and it could be our idea as yeah, opposed then to me how it is. Yeah. Passion and that those calculated risks, you're yep. equally invested. Okay. Yep. And we had decided uh, a month before that we were going to work at the intersection of human connection and growth. Ooh, and so we draw yep. two circles. Where do they, where do they intersect? Where do they overlap? We're very passionate about human connection and growth. And so let's find well, something there. And I did a little research on you. Oh, good. And these have been things you've been writing about and talking about for years. You've got a couple of articles on Medium to this point, right? Thanks. Yeah. Well, that's, that's fun that you did your, uh, your background research. <laughs> but, but yeah, I've been passionate about human connection and growth for at least four, maybe five, six years. Um, and so we found that intersection. We found an idea. And all we had was a name. And we said, we're going to launch. And we said, well, when are we going to launch? And there was an event coming up three days later called Silicon Slopes. <laughs> three and it days. Was going to have 15 to 20,000 people there. And we thought, what better place to launch than Silicon Slopes? And we had nothing at that point. And so we made a whiteboard, this whiteboard behind me. We filled it up with all the things that a, a business would need to be launched and to get awareness and to start to get traction around at least the vision of the idea. And so we decided we would create a logo and a website and a brand. We printed t-shirts. We had business cards. We had all of that. Already in three days. In three days. Yep. Uh, three days. And then we did a social awareness campaign. What we did was Silicon Slopes had, uh, I think it was 65 sessions. And we mapped each of the sessions to three books that would, that would pair well with those sessions. And we essentially created a Silicon Slopes book club. So attend the sessions and then read the books afterward to strengthen your understanding of the concepts that you're reading and doing. And then we found all of the tools that we needed to automate a Twitter storm, essentially, of books related to sessions. And then we tweet them out after the sessions. And we had that all on automation. Um, and then we, um, we created these vision boards. I'll, I'll go grab one real quick. Sorry. Um, So 
So uh, my wife, my wife, uh, we sliced these up. They're shower board, just like the whiteboard behind you. And uh, we made the, the logo stickers and the Silicon Slope stickers. And then we did this header, a book that changed my life. And then we would talk to people at Silicon Slopes and ask them to write on here a book that changed their life and then hold it and take a picture with it. We ended up getting 30,000 impressions on the pictures um, that we created that way. And so a company that didn't exist three days prior had 30,000 people now who knew that it existed Steve. and were kind of curious and interested. That's nuts. Yeah, it was pretty fun. Um, and it was, it was because it tied in the brand of Silicon Slopes, it tied in our brand, and it had a powerful message about reading. People really enjoyed it. We'd had people all conference, all, that, all of that conference coming and talking to us saying, oh, you're the book club guys, I've been seeing your stuff. It's like, yeah, uh, what do you do? Well, we don't do anything yet, but we will soon. And uh, so they were generating some interest and that sort of thing. Um, luckily, during that conference, I also got a text message from a good friend and mentor. Her name is Whitney Johnson. And she writes for Harvard Business Press and has an amazing yep. company. She's written three books. And, and she texted me. She said, I'm in town for Silicon Slopes. Do you want to meet? And I thought, oh, my gosh. She's, she proactively reached out to me. Uh, for the past two years, it's been me kind of reaching out to her and sending messages and emails and just trying to get some attention and help and support. And she set aside 20 minutes for me at, at the conference and said, what are you up to? What are you doing? And I said, well, we launched a company today. She's like, today? And I said, yeah. And what is it? It's book club. And she said, well, what can I do to help? And I said, well, I want you to be the director of our board. And she said, wow, uh, I'm flattered. And we'll, let's talk about that. Let's figure that out. And uh, by the end of the conversation, to make a long story short, she said, well, in order for me to be a part of your board, uh, you need to get a paying customer as fast as you can. And I said, OK, well, we can get a paying customer right now if we want. Like, we got to make sure it's the right paying customer. She says, uh, well, just give me a paying customer. Give me a commitment right now. Look me in the eyes. When can you have a paying customer? And she said, uh, and I said, uh, well, we'll have, a, we'll have a paying customer by the end of February. Last day of and February. this was what, what day? Customer. This was um, on January 30th. Yeah, so we had one month to get our first paying customer. And remember, three days prior, we didn't have anything. Yep. At all. And so now we've got, you know, logo, brand, website, whatever. We got a little bit of value proposition, some ideas about what we're going to do. We've ha we had uh, 10 or 12 interviews at Silicon Slopes with our target customer and, and user base. And then um, we ended up um, missing on the commitment. Uh, we ended up getting our first paying customer on uh, March 2nd. And the reason is, is because uh, our first buyer, uh, she set a meeting with us on February 29th, which is Saturday morning at 7.30 a.m. <laughs> and uh, we agreed in principle to the relationship and she was going to fill out the order form, but apparently she had loaned her corporate uh, credit card to someone in the organization on Friday because uh, there were some, some software outages that she had to respond to that day. And so on Monday morning, March 2nd, she, uh, she filled out the order form. We had our, our order form and, and our first paying customer. So then I sent um, an email to Whitney and I said, uh, listen, no excuses. I missed on my commitment. Um, I told you that by February 29th, we'd have our first paid customer. And today is when we got our first paying customer, March 2nd. Um, I know exactly what I do in the future to make sure I don't make those same mistakes again. And I uh, apologize for missing the commitment and I hope you're willing to move forward with us still. And she sent back a, a massive congratulations. And obviously, it didn't matter nearly as much to her that it was March 2nd as it did to me. But, uh, but we made that first commit when we got that first paying customer. And I'll tell you that, just to close the story off, there is no better thing that you can do as an entrepreneur than push yourself as fast as you possibly can imagine going to getting that first paying customer. Um, that first paying customer to answer your you question. Hold yourself fully. Very seriously to the deadlines you set for yeah. yourself. Yeah. 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 And we sold it before the software existed. There was no software that existed when the deal closed. Um, there were some ideas and a little bit of code written, but nothing that worked at all. Um, the first paying customer came from one of my best relationships. And so start with your best relationships because they'll be tolerant to some of the early bumps and they'll, give you feedback where other people might not. Um, and that's how you know if you have a good relationship too. It's not the friend that pushes you to audition on American Idol, even though you suck at singing. 
it's the friend who tells you not to sing on American Idol <laughs> and go do this other thing that you're really good at instead and gives you that hard feedback. And that's the type of first buyer that we had was someone who was understanding of what the challenges would be as part of the process, but also very aware of, of my strengths, of the strengths of the business, of the strengths of the vision, and willing to partner and help make it better and, and move through the pivots together and co-create and all of those sorts of things. And we actually sold the vision on a whiteboard. It was a bunch of whiteboard drawings. After that, she said, okay, I'm in. And then she said, how much does it cost? And I said, well, it's $500. I pulled that out of the air, you know, just like, what can she swipe with her credit card, right? Like, I've got to get this deal closed. This is the last chance uh, to make my commitment with Whitney. And, uh, and then she says, okay, deal, I'm in. And then she says, what did I just buy? And then we have to walk it back a little and say, well, here's the product and here's the services and here's how it will all work and let's meet next week and we'll finalize everything. And, and we did, but not even just getting that first paying customer, but then launching that first paying customer has been more clarifying both to the relationship between me and Todd as my co-founder, uh, but also clarifying to the vision and progress and, and, and steps and strategy for the business than any right. other possible thing could be. Well, and dollars wise, like, they're robbing you blind. <laughs> we, we are giving at least $3,000 of value for $500 yeah. in payment in return. But to your point, right? Like without that, without having pushed yourself to get that first paying customer, you might miss on deadlines to create the product. You might miss on feedback that you need to make the product better. Real life usage of the product, whether it's for little to no cost at all or a lot, right, is what you need to push this forward. Yep, 100%. And so we put on, on our partnership expectation slides, here's the $500 that we're, we're trying to get. But down the middle, our expectations of you as our buyer, we need that feedback. We need that partnership. We need to co-create with you. We need insights. We need to be able to do surveys. Like we're going to have a little bit higher touch with your users and, and your company than would typically be expected. Uh, in a customer vendor relationship, but that's that's the value we're now getting. It's It goes way above and beyond the $500. It might be worth tens of thousands of dollars to us in the long run. Yeah. Because of the feedback that we get and how early on in the process we were able to get that feedback. Yeah. So what three takeaways would you have for entrepreneurs, whether they're jewelry makers, um, launching an HVAC business or producing a SaaS product, what would your three action items be for an entrepreneur at this time? Yep. So it'll be simple to remember, invest in relationships, invest in learning and invest in yourself. So let's start with the relationships. Um, one key action today, don't try to think of all your relationships. Think of one relationship. Which of your relationships is most critical to your success? Um, for me, that's probably the relationship with my spouse first. Um, if that relationship's not solid and strong, this is coming apart. She's been an incredible uh, mentor, advisor. She slips in with these bits of wisdom where she's, she's sitting back watching maybe the fights I'm having with my co-founder, the challenges I'm facing with launching this first customer. And she's got this wisdom because she's just, sitting back quietly from a dis. okay, let me share some wisdom with you. And so if I invest in that relationship first, then that's going to be helpful to uh, my success or, or failure as an entrepreneur. I need to invest in that relationship. Yeah. Think of one, maybe two, maybe one in your personal life, one in the professional life, and, and you're probably under investing in those two most critical relationships. Almost everyone is. And so invest more in those one or two most critical relationships. Yeah. Uh, number two, invest in your learning. So do not try to learn everything at once. There's an infinite list of things to learn as an entrepreneur. Pick one thing that you can learn right now. Uh, you probably know what that one skill is that's holding you back. If I just had this one skill, it would launch me forward. Then find a mentor, find a book, get a teacher to help you learn that skill. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of jumping in and doing that thing that you yeah. need to learn. Do. Let's say that it's social media. You, you know that if you just did social media marketing well and had that kind of influencer persona to you as a business owner, that it would just make all the difference. But you haven't posted. You haven't even liked on posts. You haven't commented on posts. You're just so afraid to jump in that you haven't been able to build that skill. 
So maybe it's a combination of finding that book, that mentor, and then just jump in and learn that skill. And then the third one, invest in yourself. Um, there's an entrepreneur who I met in college who had sold his first company. He invited me to his home. We were at Best Buy and he's just like, hey, do you want to come to my house? And I was like, no, that's kind of weird, but yeah, I do because uh, you're rich and you've sold a company. And I was just a young college kid. I didn't know what I was doing. And he, he gave me three tips for entrepreneurship. Number one, he told me to invest in my body and my mind. And so he showed me his fridge. It was filled with all whole foods and you know, fruits and vegetables and great stuff that you know you want in your body. I told him that like it looked, it looked like a terrible fridge. There was nothing good to eat in there. And uh, he, said, he said, this is step one, is invest in your body and, and your mind. If your body doesn't work, yep. if your mind doesn't work, you're toast. It doesn't yeah. matter. 100%. Like, you could just push it to the ground and you, you fall apart because you're working 80 hours a week and your mind falls apart. Or your not body sleeping. Falls apart. The yep. old 1990s badge of honor. Yep. Can't do it. You nope. have to invest in your body and your mind. Um, he said, then your family, he showed me a picture of his family and he said, you got to stay centered. Like if this falls apart, it all falls apart. Keep this together. And then finally he said, invest in your faith. And so whatever that is, People have spiritual leanings of different sorts. You've got a different way of, you know, it's meditation, it's yoga, it's mindfulness, it's, it's all of those sorts of things. It could be prayer. It's whatever it is. He said, invest in that uh, spirituality and that faith. And if you stay centered and healthy and focused on your family, that you'll be able to find success. And so invest in relationships, invest in learning, and invest in uh, yourself. Yeah. That is well put. Very concise, Steve very like you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, thank you for your time. Um, we've had a few baby noises in the background, so I appreciate it. <laughs> and there, there's the newest noise. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> thank you so much. I found this very insightful and know that others who are having ideas, who are wanting to solve some of these new and interesting problems that are arising today, um will gain some wonderful insight and inspiration from you so i appreciate you thanks casey it's been fun thanks for listening to that episode of we've connected make sure to hit subscribe down below so you get notified of any time we add a new episode we'll catch you next time